Our speaker tonight, uh, Sarah Brown, is a native of Kansas, Kansas, but was raised in Sao Paulo, Brazil. She's a Vietnam vet, and she worked for Motorola Communications as a senior program manager for 23 years, and then for Gibson Hill Incorporated as a system design team manager, and then in the Department of Defense at Fort George Meade for 25 years. She's earned a Master's of General Administration from the University of Maryland University College and a Master's of Science in Strategic Intelligence from the Joint Military Intelligence College and is a senior member of IEEE. She actively contributes to research on astronomy by means of computers in her own home. And to increase the power of those computers, she now builds her own computers, which is very impressive to me. <clears throat> Tonight, she'll tell us about this route to contributing to scientific advantage, advances, and you may well find that it's something you want to do, too. Sarah. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. And uh, welcome to the, the speech I'm going to give tonight. I wish I could have be, wish I was a super astronomer, that I could give you a super elegant talk, but uh, that's not where I'm coming from. So what we're going to do is we're going to go down through a path tonight of the way I got into astronomy and some of the things that I learned and how I enjoy it. So. Bear with me for just a minute and we'll go through it. I'd like to, to quote a friend of mine, my neighbor, we call him Sherlock, and his real name is John, James Jones, but he is a detective at the police department. And he says, the reality that I see doesn't reside in the crime, but it exists in the evidence, in the actors, in the situation that caused the occurrence. These things aren't necessarily apparent to windows and mirrors. We need to take advantage of all the facts available. In his words, do beg examination of the following facts. We're living in an era when there is exponentially increasing astronomic discovery and knowledge, like all the planets we've discovered now and in, in, in other galaxies and other on other worlds. It's in an era when the science is poorly viewed by a few leaders powerful enough to increasingly deplete resources for nonprofit making other than for nonprofit making organizations. Okay? On the other hand, the sum of all worldwide excess capacity of computers is equal to the largest computing capacity man has ever known. Now let me see if I can see what I'm going here. So we have our friend Sherlock looking through a window, looking through Boink, and looking at several projects on, on Boink. We're not all real smart, though. All right. I think you Some guys are smart. smarter than others. Okay. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a little X amount of what I'm talking about when I say we have excess capacity in the world today. This is a typical CPU, actually it's above average CPU, <laughs> but you can see for doing communications you're only using about 15% of the CPU. For if, if I load it up with a scientific project, I can still run an online movie. Uh, if I do use e-commerce, I'm only using about 20% of the CPU. Now granted, this is a, this is a rough little uh, CPU is an I-2700K, to but this is what a, a really, really light, light gamer would use and, and a business person would use. So you can see there, this is all sitting, it's sitting there loafing except for an occasional spurt when it, need, you know, it has to do graphics or something else like that. So, my first encounter with this particular whole subject was when I ran into a a friend's house and I saw this on his on his computer it's, and I and I asked him what it was and he said it was the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and it was operating like a little pretty screensaver now normally this thing would be moving forward like this and if you'll notice very carefully it does demonstrate a whole series of, of uh, 
parametrics about the signal. In other words, you have the frequency spread, you have it in time, and you have the power of the signal that you're watching. So I was intrigued by this, and I couldn't figure out what it is and what it was, it was doing, where it was coming from, and he explained that the signal was coming from the Arecibo Telescope in Puerto Rico. So I looked it up. I was really fascinated. And shortly thereafter, my study of, of astronomy through what I call the back door of astronomy began, and it was called SETI. The program looked for signals of artificial intelligence, uh, I'm sorry, uh, intelligence outside of our solar system. And while it has its limitations and skeptics, it uses a robust operational framework system called the Berkeley Open Infrastructure for Network Computing, B-O-I-N-C, BOINC. Boink. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to refer to B-O-I-N-C, but occasionally I'll shorten it to, to BOINC, okay? So let's take a look at SETI for just a second here and see what we're talking about. We're talking about... Uh, 1,429,000 users and active users at the, at the given point of that day at that time was 135,000 people were online running that thing as a screensaver or as in the background or full time on their computers. You get a choice of how you wish to use it. Now, what I'm going to do is try to find this button down here that I'm <laughs> having a hard time seeing. S uh, SETI at home is what it's really called and it searches for possible evidence of radio transmissions from extraterrestrial intelligence using observational data from the Arecibo telescope. Now the data is taken piggyback or passively along with other experiments that are looking at the sky, okay? So it's not, it's, it's, it's using, it's taking, it's opportunistic in the fact that it's looking around like that, and then it's digitized, stored, and sent to set the SETI at home facilities on tape. It's parsed into small chunks and that, and time, analyzed, and uses home <laughs> software to search for any signals. And I'll go into that in a little bit on how, how that all occurs. So far, millions of chunks of data, each sample of data is analyzed off-site by the home computers, and when complete, the software results are reported back to SETI servers. Thus, what appears to be an onerous task in data analysis is reduced down to a reasonable one by the aid of the large internet-based community. But where was I supposed to start with this? Where would I go? And I, there is a web-based site, a website, to get information and connect to SETI and it's in the BOINC point website. So that's where I went. So let's see here. Now it's very easy for a regular citizen to participate in SETI and other astronomic programs, astronomy programs. And I want to make it perfectly clear that there are 30 to 40 different programs using BOINC. So if you think that it's just SETI, you're wrong, because, because like I said, there's anything from gene gene uh, gene analysis to astronomy on that particular thing. They look for random numbers. They use all kinds of different programs. If you go on the site, you'll see a selection of the different things you can do. But for right now, I'm interested in astronomy. So it's really easy for the regular citizen to participate in SETI and other astronomy programs. You need a modern program, a computer connected to the internet. You go to the Boink website, select a program such as SETI. Your computer calls the host to get tasking and work files from the project servers. The host computes the data and we call our home computers the host, by the way. So when I refer to host, and sometimes some of these, this literature refers to it as client. I'm talking about our home computers. Host, a host computes the data, uploads the output files to one project server, and reports completing the task to the scheduling server and requests new, new work. The cycle is repeated. 
point fits the task the computer capabilities. So if you got a big computer and it runs full time, the point knows about it and it, it adjusts accordingly. If you got a small computer and all you want to do is a screen server and all you got is four, four um, uh, megabytes of RAM, then Boink adjusts for that too. It, it adjusts and, and only gives as much information to work on as, is, as the computer is capable of. Now, everybody knows the next picture. And that's, of course, Arecibo. <laughs> and there's 980 tons just hanging around that everybody's seen that beautiful picture. I've, and then we also have had opportunities to get some SETI information <laughs> off of Green Bank. So I thought that was kind of kind of neat. Now, the initial user's fascination with SETI is the possibility of finding extra solar intelligence like the movie Contact. We get a lot of people in SETI that came because of that. The ease of participation and the fascination of working with the world's largest telescopes and largest computer system. Now, considering the vast area this the telescopes cover, SETI receivers are turned on certain hours when it's pointed toward areas with the highest probability of intelligent life. But remember, it's working piggyback on the on the on the uh, on the uh, the uh, receivers of other projects. Okay, it's taking it off the feed of other projects. So what you see here is the Milky Way. This is a scale of time, and the red is the various places over that particular day where it was pointed toward. Now they turned on receivers when they passed areas that had higher probability of, 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 of uh, intelligence life or intelligent reception of a signal and other places they didn't. So wherever they, they turned on, that was the selection that the SETI folks made. I hope they're not pointing at Vega because there's no chance there. <laughs> oh. you, uh, did you say Vega or Vegas? Vega. Oh. Like contact. Uh oh. <laughs> it's the wrong kind of star. Yeah. The red line represents, of course, like I said, the typical searched areas. Now, SETI collects a signal between 1.41 and 1.42 gigahertz, or a band of about 2.5 megahertz. Megas the assumption of the SETI authors is that the frequency of hydrogen, the most abundant material in the universe, would be used by intelligent creatures to communicate with aliens. That would be us. Okay. <laughs> the possibility of finding a signal used by intelligent creatures is incredibly hard. The project's solid scientific methodology, romanticism, and adventure is what inspires hundreds of thousands of people to participate in it. So as you saw from the numbers, a lot of people participate in this program, okay? And, and I did for, a, for about two or three years, and I decided to go a little bit further. But let's go through and use SETI as an example of how the BOINC works, okay? So that we can, we can uh, get an idea for further projects that I'm going to describe. You got a signal coming in here from an alien sitting on a star or somebody, or maybe it's like us. It's, you know, NORAD sweeping, sending out tremendous amounts of energy, hopefully a 1.41 to a 1.42 signal. It goes through the interstellar medium, and I only put that up there because in other projects that's going to matter, okay? The R signal is picked up by the antenna. It goes through a series of amplifiers and spectra, spectra, spectrometers. It's broken out into parsed into a signal. It's put on tape. The tapes are brought back to Berkeley. It goes through signal parsers, data 
a project data and the other scheduled servers, then send it out to routers to two host computers. And if the two host computers do what they're supposed to do, it goes back, it, it, and, it, and if those two agree, then we, it gets sent on to be vetted by uh, more sophisticated uh, folks. Okay, let me see here if I can find this button. This pesky button here. The SETI project splitters data in a scheduling computer's parse samples called work units and forward to each host, which is of course again, hosts are our computers at home, work units of, of data, signal data selected from 256 samples, 10 kilohertz wide and 107 seconds long. The computer, the SETI program installed on the host, examines each work unit by, gotta find that button again, measuring the relative power of the signal to noise ratio, so signals that are too strong or too weak are thrown out, measuring the growth and decline of the signal caused by the Earth's rotation, because obviously that, as, 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 um, as Arecibo swings by the signal that's going to grow and it's going to, to fall off. By removing the signal Doppler shift caused by the relative motion between the signal source and the earth. And it's doing that at a two, uh, 25,000 checks per uh, individual pass. And then it divides the signal into eight blocks of 13 seconds each and each block is examined at a 0 0.07 hertz for peaks and those peaks would be looking for signals okay and that's uh, uh, the signals are analyzed for different possible types of signals from multiple passes to signals searches varying with the frequency bandwidth versus relative resolution of each path so I'm looking at it from a wide perspective, then I'm looking at it at a more narrow perspective, then I'm looking at this chunk for a, a more narrow perspective, and as I'm going along, <clears throat> gradually my resolution is increasing, okay? And also it gives me an opportunity to see if the shape of that particular uh, signal is different or it can be interpreted as a signal, okay? So it's a technique called fast folding algorithm. And it's, it's uh, for each pass checking each frequency for repeating small signals. Okay, the fast folding algorithm is used in another aspect of SETI that's, uh, I'm not going to cover here, called AstroPulse. Now remember, SETI is looking for narrow signals, relatively narrow signals. The, the, it has an, a, a, a another version which is called AstroPulse which looks for wide signals, broadband signals. So it's not like these people are stuck with just looking for very narrow signals, okay? They're looking for pulses also, repetitive pulses. But I'm not going to go into that because I really don't have enough time in this discussion today to go into that. But I invite you to look at it if you're interested in that sort of thing. Now, if it's a pulse signal, there's a good opportunity because of fast rides, obviously that you could, might not catch it in this looking for various frequencies. So what they do is they look through all the frequencies for the rep, three repetitions of the same signal. So it goes through every one of these frequencies as it goes through time, looking also for three repetitions of the, of the same signal. So you can see this is not Fun. This is very sophisticated search techniques, and they've improved on these search techniques as time has gone by. Now, you may not agree with the particular philosophy of what they're trying to accomplish, but you have to admire the the, the philosophic um, elegance that they've 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 gone forward to try to do what they're trying to do. I, and that's my opinion, Sarah Brown. That was an advertisement. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Especially considering that there are thousands of pulsars out there that are also putting out pulse signals. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And you have to throw but we, those away. But wait, I've got something for you in that respect. It's coming.
<laughs> okay. To date, only one candidate signal has been found, although over 100 candidate signals have been found. But what's great about it is an enormous amount of metadata about space has been found. Remember, they look, they're looking through ISM, so they've, they have that on tape. And a large scale, and large scale computer aided searches have been formally proven. So let's talk about the Boink framework, or BOINC, I promise you I'd say BOINC, right? Uh, framework that SETI and other projects use. I like Boink better. You like Boink better? Ah, <laughs> uh, no. That's not. <laughs> it's relatively. Okay, here's some of the assumptions of Boink. Okay? We're looking at the world. The world of people with computers, with spare time on their computers. So what are we thinking about? We're thinking about it's got to be a relatively immune to accidental or intentional, and there's a lot of intentional malicious actions and errors by millions of volunteers. It assigns each task a due date and monitors the host activities for on-time completion of tasks, and it throws out and it reassigns overdue tasks. It sends each task to two different hosts, okay, is, and, and compares the results of both. And if they're not exactly the same, the results are thrown out and the data is assigned to two other hosts. If the response is equal, and if the test is legitimate, it indicates, and indicates, and indicates a detection of a signal, it's further analyzed by the project scientists. Okay. If you're a user and you a host and you're, you detect your machine is detecting signal, does it tell you? It doesn't. It doesn't. It basically For because it doesn't yeah. it doesn't matter if you have figured out <coughs> one because it's got to be compared with somebody else. Yeah. All right, for the for the project to think about, it. and they used to have three computers looking at it, because th there were people out there that made it their lives to spoof this. Okay, I mean they they, they just you know it it was their yeah. mission in life to 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 blow this away. I can understand and, that. Yeah. Oh, that should be bad. Okay. <laughs> All right. The main point. Uh, technical constraints are it's embarrassingly parallel, so the solutions require no communication or independence between hosts. All hosts are considered idiots, I'm sorry, they're considered to be undependable and may corrupt the data or just disappear. You know, boyfriend, girlfriend rolling around on the floor, unplug the computer. And that's the end of the data, right? So there we go. You know, we well, what happens? It times out, and it, it gets given to two other people. Okay, it does have a high ratio of computer input output, which makes sense. And the limitations would be the project maximum capabilities, and and obviously the whether there's signal around because it ran, they ran out of actually signal from for, for a while in one of the projects, and the host capabilities. How many people are hooked up? We've never really had that much of a problem with that. It must use a very small fraction of the of the host RAM because they don't want it to to, to not the, the the activities of the host to, to be able to take over since it's a screensaver. So it can't just hog up all the time, and it's got to have frequent and unobtrusive checkpointing. So it periodically it stops and says, okay, I, I'm going to save this chunk in memory, and in case this person turns off the thing or gets busy doing stuff, and, and it turns off. So the checkpointing is very quick, and it's got to be very mature and compatible with a whole lot of different operating, operating systems. <clears throat> so as you can tell, gosh, I wish I could see this. Did I just go backwards? Yep. Yes. Mm. Double clutcher. Yeah. <laughs> there, that's new. All right. Okay. So, the Boink is a framework of 30 or 40 projects are on it, and each project has its own servers and networks, but they share the population of volunteer computers amassed by Boink. Now, let's look at another project using Boink to confirm the statement. 
even though the pursuit of aliens and study of ISM are interesting, there are other programs equally or more interesting. The Milky Way at Home project seeks to study the magnitude and fragments of the, of the Milky Way, our galaxy, in three dimension study, resulting in the future knowledge of total galaxy mass, interaction of the galaxies, and research in modeling and determining the evolution of Milky Way galaxy. I just think, I included this because I just think this is the most beautiful picture that I've ever seen of it. But basically, we're going to be looking at, at this section up here and the, um, the, um, oh, I don't know, I'm, I'm running into a brain freeze right now. This, this section right below and above it, the oh, halo is the section that they're they're looking at right now, okay? So mostly inside the galaxy. Yeah. Our galaxy. Yeah, it's our galaxy is, is Milky Way. But what they're going to look at are the streams in that in the galaxy. So is any everybody here familiar with the arguments of of the Milky Way galaxy formation? Is there anybody here that's not familiar with the fact that the that now it's there's a lot of argument about whether a large part of it was formed through collision with smaller galaxy and the and the whole infrastructure of the galaxy is different than what would be normally assumed because of collisions with smaller galaxies and it and involving and wrapping around galaxies. Everybody's familiar with that, right? Or is, well, is there anybody? Really no. No. Okay. We don't know the okay. The, the the initial idea of the formation of of the Milky Way was that there was a large pot, you know, pocket of gas, or there was a large amount of gas out there. It coalesced. You know, stars, and planets were formulated. A very large nucleus was formulated. Everything swirled around, and that makes that that whole idea is fairly uniform in nature, okay? So everybody went along with that assumption that the galaxy is a relatively uniform place. It had this, it had this uh, cap that was full of all these old stars. It's about a hundred thousand uh, light years wide, you know, and it's a fairly normal place. It's kind of, kind of a wishy-washy black hole in the center and it's just kind of a, a nice galaxy, you know, a routine nice galaxy, a place you want to move to. But they have found streamers going through the galaxy that, that have made disruptive appearances throughout the thing that, that don't make it look as homogenous and nice and neat as they formerly thought it was. Plus the fact that the, th the streamers and the things turns out are a result of smaller galaxy kind of running into our galaxy, getting stripped into streamers by the gravitational forces of our galaxy. And consequently, uh, now they want to know. And plus the fact that these behaviors of these, these, these phenomena weren't exactly predictable because of their other forces working on that and that appears to be a dark matter. So there's all kinds of mis mysteries and, and places to work and these are very big problems and they're problems requiring enormous amounts of computational uh, compu computation because you're talking about enormous things that are going over and to try to make to make this all coherent You've got to strip away different sections and layers of the galaxy and look behind what's there to get to these streams and stuff of galaxies that have been torn apart and have been integrated into our galaxy and things like that. All right, I got, I'm a little ahead of myself there. But anyway, so the resulting is the future knowledge of the total galaxy mass interactions of galaxies and research and modeling and determining the evolution of the galaxy. Let me see if I can find that button. Okay, the Milky Way home 
Milky Way Home uses the BOINC as a platform to create exact, highly exact models of the Milky Way galaxy using data collected from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey Telescope and Apache Point Observatory in New Mexico. Is everybody familiar with the Apache Point? Oh, yeah. No? no? Whoa. It's a long drive to get there. It's a long drive to anywhere, but anyway, <laughs> you notice the number of active users is lower on Milky Way. Why do you suppose that is, she asked? That's not as well known. No, because the chunks that they're sending out are much larger. They're requiring like 10, 15, 20 hours of analysis. And so the kind of person that just uses a screensaver that can no longer use it as just a screensaver. It's really a, a, a uh, either you use it as a background and, and leave your computer on, or it's for people that do this full time, you know, nuts like me that build the computers that just let them run this for 24-7, for okay? So we have... 22,000, at this particular point in time, we have 22,000 active users out of the 167 <clears throat> signed up users that will come off and on. That, now, all these numbers are fluctuating, but look at the amount of, uh, of, of computation that, they're, that those users are creating. So we're talking about relatively large scale users that really do crunch a lot of a lot of data. Ma'am, yes. do you think everybody here knows what a flop is? <laughs> Probably not. Probably. <laughs> Giga flop. Well, a flop is one computation. Right. So, yeah, it's just one, one, one operation. Yeah, one operation. Per second. Yeah, well, per second. Yeah, yeah per second. Yeah. Yeah, per second. Point, point operations per yeah. second. Yeah. Right, right. And so that's the number of computations that are taking place, mathematical computations. Right. And what's a gigaflop? A million. Is that a million? Giga's a billion. A giga is a billion. And Terra is is uh a twelfth. Yeah. A lot of computations. Yes. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Well if you have a machine that's working at uh, let's say four gigahertz, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how long would it take to do uh, to a teraflop. You know, that's, a, that's a good question. Yeah. Do you know the answer? Um, I figured it out once a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a while. But I, I'm so glad that you I'm so glad you brought that up, sir, because I didn't think anybody would be interested particularly in that in that data. But it's wonderful that, that you brought it up and explained it to the audience. So thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, if you mm -hmm. look at that, I think the Average billion point operations per second for Milky Way is over half that of SETI, despite the fact there's such a smaller number of users. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a different breed of cat, you know. <laughs> but I didn't want to say that out loud. Much more complex. All right. Anyway, so I wanted to show you a picture of a man and his telescope. And that's. <laughs> That's a patchy point. I'm jealous. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the Sloan Digital yeah. Sky yeah, Survey. Yeah. And yeah. it's got like, I don't know, I don't remember, it's 30 different elements in it with in incredible amounts of density of, 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 uh, of, of resolution. And it's just an amazing box. There's no dome over that thing or anything? Ah, uh, I'm glad you asked that question because there's the front of it. You yeah. see, it has little flap thingies and all they close on that. I don't know if they do cover it or not. I, I'm, I don't know. It looks. I think there's a house that goes over. Yeah, it. a square yeah, building. I believe it's, it's a roll over. off. Yeah, it's, it's a, a roll off. Shed. Like, yeah. There's rails on the side right. by the rail by the railing. There's rail. It's a movable mm -hmm. building. I've been there and it was inside. I couldn't see it when when my wife and I drove there. Ah. And where is that? It's outside Cloudcroft, but it's a long. My long drive statement meant that it's a long way out of Cloudcroft, not from here. You have to drive 25 miles over a road, a narrow road from Cloudcroft to get there. 
What state is Cloud Croft? In? New Mexico. Yeah. Mexico. Yeah. It's just east of uh, Alamogordo. It, it sort of looks like there's a railroad track or something there that is covered. Yeah. Yeah. like the observatory here. Yes. Using research from the computer and astronomic sciences, the project creates very precise models in 3D and it analyzes the stars in the Milky Way's ga galaxy's galactic halo. This includes searching for elusive dark matter, mapping structures of stars orbiting the Milky Way. Many of these structures are actually tidal debris streams. Remember I told you how it stripped how our galaxy stripped apart this dwarf galaxies. The orbits, shapes, and composition of these dwarf galaxies may provide vital clues to the history of our galaxy as well as the distribution of dark matter and thus understand galaxy formation. Okay. Now, Milky Way is based in the Rins... I never can pronounce this right. Is it Rensselaer? Rensselaer. Rensselaer. Institute of oh, Computer IT. Science Department in, in New York City. In New York. State. I'm sorry, not New York, New York, New York State. State. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm Detroit. sorry. Detroit. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Oh. Okay. The, <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> this particular project. Now, you got to understand Rensselaer is a computer science organization. I mean, they, that's their big that's forte, idea. okay? Right. But they needed a project that was big enough for them to tackle. And God was busy. So they said, well, can we use the universe? And they said, no! And so we said, how about the galaxy? So they said, oh, okay, we'll, we'll loan you the galaxy. So that's when they did, they took on the astronomy project. And so the uh, uh, <laughs> Why do we need to do anything at all if God has solved all these problems? Well, God is... <laughs> He's what busy. Is this, God was busy, yeah. yeah right. So, okay, let's take a look and see what we're looking at here. So, here we have the, the halo and the dark matter is wedged in there somehow. We haven't figured that out because we don't even know what it is. And if you see that little... You see how it... Uh, that's the wedge that we're looking at. And what we're going to do, and this is, I'm going to cover this in the boring prose, but we're going to take various shots of this, okay, these wedges, and then what we're going to do is we're going to take theoretical models and match them against this until we finally find theoretical models that match it and look like they are right for a given depth and slice of this. Okay? Because the point here is 3D. So the, the problem that we have is we're looking at this whole thing through a series of stars and it's hard to make a distinguish the, the particular aspects of what it is we're looking at. We know the stream is there but we can't define the parameters of it. Are you confronting okay. the question, what is the material of our initial galaxy as disturbed by such a, an invader, or is it material of the invader that's left behind among us? I think it's both. Mm -hmm. I think it's really, what is it, mm -hmm. is more the question that, that, that's open. Super I think that, that defining right now is, if we can define in 3D what's there, then that, that's, that's, that's the initial shot, you know. Now, Sloan is doing a lot of other stuff, you know. If I read just SETI, I mean, Milky Way at Home, I would think they were the only ones on that project. But when you look at the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, you realize Milky Way at Home is only a minor part of the things they do with that telescope. It's just amazing amount of research. And I invite everybody to look at the, the um, uh, Sloan Digital Sky Project web page because you'd just be astounded at the amount of stuff that they've found and worked on and, and defined. But this is important because we have the, in, in, in 
B O I N C, we have the computational capability to go in and work these problems at the picayune level that it takes, you know, by matching model and matching model and matching model over and over and over again until we can start to, to, to come up with some precise measurements. And I'll go into that in, in a second, okay? Using the data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, Milky Way at home divides scarf fields into wedges of about 2.5 uh, with and applies self-optimizing probabilistic separation techniques. The program then attempts to, to create a new uniform dense wedge of stars from input of the wedge by removing streams of data. So one of the points of this is to come up with something, a, level, a, a, a layer that's real, that, that's been proven, and actually matches what's in the sky and then take that away. Because then what's left behind it is you can go on and start to look at that. And then, then you can go on and be, look at that. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. 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 Okay. So now, because we're going to explain this in all kinds of strange ways. Of, Compare what's expected with what's observed. Right. So the percentage of stars in the streams, okay. each stream yeah. removal, removed is characterized as six parameters. The percentage of stars in the stream, angular position of the stripe, and three spatial components, three an two angles plus the radial distance from the Earth, defining the removed uh, For each search, the server <coughs> application keeps track of a population of individual stars, each which is attached to the possible model. The data is from the Sloan, and, and the Sloan survey incidentally just released 10 terabytes of image is in spectra on online <laughs> categories, so uh, catalogs. So you've got, if you want to have something to read at night before you go to bed, you can <laughs> the observed density is drawn from a mixture of, of uh, distribution bounded by fragments of local substructure stars in the data compared to smooth global background population. Parameters that specify the position and distribution of substructure and the parameters of smooth background. Specifically, this is a probability density function. It calculates the, the chance of obtaining a observed star distribution after repeated independent sampling of independent star, or total sets of stars. Okay, let's look at a, bit, a little bit of uh, vocabulary here. And I don't, I'm not gonna fog everybody because if you look at on at the very bottom of the page, you'll see the answer. <laughs> so it uses, it, for those in the audience, and I know there are people in the audience that understand this stuff, it's meta heuristics at a high level procedures that are designed to find and select, and a lower level procedures, and so, this is our procedures that are selecting procedures that go around and, and, and can actually fit the searches that provide a sufficient good solution to optimization programs with incomplete or imperfect information. Imperfect information or imper incomplete information is the fact that you've got this maze of stars and you can't figure out the depths of them or exactly some of the proportions of them. Candidate solution, and I'm going to let you read the rest of this, is candidate solutions are entity of populations, evolution of populations, and such probabilistic frameworks give a natural sampling algorithm for separating galaxy substructure from the background. Does that make sense to everybody? No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you have the arms of the galaxy. It's not, it's not going to be occupied with things of that scale. <coughs> Is that are you collecting just positional data or are you are you collecting other other or analyzing other kinds of data like spectroscopy or, or photometry or we're taking the photog uh, the the photographic information from the from the telescope. I mean, is it primarily positional data for the proper motion and no, I, I remember. Not. I remember that argument. I read that up on there. Yes, as a matter of fact, it's the photographic information that's coming from the the telescope, uh, okay. and that's the problem because you're not getting all that beautiful information you're 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 referring to. 
you know, I, 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 I know. But it's available, it's easy to get, and you can afford it. You know? They're not getting Doppler information, for instance. No, yeah. it's only 2D. Right, right. Not right. Probably right. Probably right. Can't get probably that's why it's probable. That's why you're doing probabilistics to, 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 because it, eventually it'll all match. It makes sense after you, after you, if you have enough power to throw enough probable, uh, op, uh, probable solutions at this. And remember, we're talking thousands and thousands of computers running against this. Then you can solve it that way, as opposed to the Doppler so, method you're really talking about. And besides, you might not be able to even see what you're looking for because it's <clears throat> embedded in all this other stuff in this stream of stars and stuff that are in it. <clears throat> so it's a very complex environment, and you're trying to take off the onions and the layers of it, and you can't see it. See a lot of it. Does that make sense? All they get is positional information, and 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 they do some photometry too. Brightnesses. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So what? Interesting. The general astrophysics problem involving creating a computer model that replicates what we see in the sky. If the computer model matches exactly what we see, we bypass the information and work on bigger and more involved problems. Look what we at home, application models, plates of stars, we input 2.5 degree cross sections of data. Program attempts to create new, uniform wedge, dense wedges of stars from the input wedge by removing streams of data. Streams it removes are necessarily cylindrical and its density falls off in a Gaussian manner. Density in the middle. Yeah. Okay. Does this make sense to everybody? Is everybody following me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we all know the Gaussian. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, so this is some of the work that's been accomplished thus far. I've kind of beaten this to death, so I'm not going to go into a lot of this, but I just did want you to give you an idea of the increase of people that have gotten involved in this. In 2009, you'll notice they had 331.7 teraflops of, of computing power. In 2010, the first month, they had 1,382 uh, 1, teraflops. And that was an increase because people just started getting very interested in this. And, and the word got out. And people like me came online with running computers 24 hours, 24-7. Okay, let me see where I am now. And in particular, what we'd like to know is how many merger events contributed to the buildup of the spheroid. What's the size of the, the merged galaxies were that did the collisions? And at what time in the history of Milky Way did the merger events occur? And those are the things that we're, we're shooting to try to find out. Models for the tidal disruption of merger events that build up the spheroid of the Milky Way can be matched with individual qualities quantified spatial substructures to constrain the galaxy's gravitational potential. So basically, if you can see where the, the, the kind of forms that have occurred here, you can start to begin to see what, gee, if I can find that button, since the, since the, now since the gravitational the gravitational potential is dominated by dark matter. This technique also teaches us the spatial distribution of dark matter in the Milky Way. So that's another one of the objectives wow. here. Okay. If it exists. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> by mid-2009, the project's main astrophysical interest was in the Sagittarius stream stream emanating from the Sagittarius Dwarf Elliptical Galaxy, which is partially penetrates this, this, the space occupied by the Milky Way. It's believed to have an unstable orbit around it, probably after a close encounter, encounter or collision with the Milky Way, which was subjected to very strong tidal, tidal forces. <clears throat> Let me 
it's Okay. Problem is, it's on the other side of the center of the galaxy. You can't see the dark thing. Very that's well. one of the problems that. That's why you have to strip away all this. The these things. Has it seen that it's exited, or is it on the way through still, or what's going on? <clears throat> well, it. I'll, I'll I'll cover that in just a little bit, in, a, in just a minute. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It, it becomes part of the picture. Okay. Uh, the objective of the separation or adjusting for stellar sea currents component of Milky Way at Home project is an analysis to determine exactly where the great stellar sea currents are hidden beyond the many other stars that are in the Aurelia of the Milky Way galaxy. These currents are a result of a collision of small galaxy with the Milky Way where the small galaxy was transformed into straight thread occurrence. To accomplish this, we, we create a mathematical model of the SDSS, which of course stands for the uh, Sloan uh, Digital, etc. Yeah, bands of data derived from the documents of Nathan Cole and best method of finding the model that represents the SDSS uh, data. Each work unit of separation is a unique valuation of the model, in other words, a simple group of parameters of the model that are um, evaluated against real data. Are those arrows missing these velocities? Um, I think they're the, they're the directions of a, of a model fits. But I don't know what the I don't know what the exact uh, the, the I don't know what the parameter is of what the uh, the, um, what the factors mean. yeah the factor is sir I think some of the essence of it is because I've been studying at home for 15 years or so is that you're doing a 3D um, instruction from 2D scans and it's done all the time with radar data for example microwave data you build up a three-dimensional structure from 2D scan data. You can then do feature extraction on the 3D data set, and things like streamers and things become evident, you know, geometric properties that exist within this substrate of gas. Right. So that, that's, how, that's how I kind of... I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. And I think that, that it's just done on a scale that's enormous. Right. You know, and, and, and I think that the models here is that they're trying to take these strips and do exactly what you're saying. They're scanning the strips, they're taking photographic information, they're probably using some of, although I've never seen it specifically stated, probably using the brightness intensity of the stars to keep map specific places along those plates as they go and, and like you're saying, use that's my understanding of what they're doing. So, um, so, the next project, that, I just wanted to show you what the actual uh, Sagittarius stream looked like. The next project that they're doing, that, said, that uh, Milky Way at Home is doing, is a theoretical model where they actually take a computer, they shoot a, a galaxy into past the Milky Way, and then they watch it as it destroys as the computer destroys that or streams out that galaxy okay well the interesting thing is then they take that and then they try to match it to a real stream and then they adjust that stream and they start working backwards and that's called the in-body project and this is an example of of the uh, this does not have the Milky Way shown in here. The Milky Way would be, this is going around the Milky Way. What's now, the yellow thing in the center of the I don't know. We've been asked that question about a million times, and, and I, don't, I don't really know what that is. It's an alien spaceship. Is that what it is? <laughs> what I can take, what I invite you to do is I invite you, if you go in the back, I have, I have a, a copy of, of all the sites that I've used in this talk 
that are sitting in the back there. And the reason I did that is so I don't get sued. And but I'm not. I mean, I bought it for your information so that you'll have references. So if you want to have a reference to this particular thing, it, it's a great site. It's Milky Way at Home, and it and this is 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 active. And I can't. I couldn't make my computer take that. But you'll see this start out as a galaxy, then it wraps itself around as it's being destroyed by the. The, 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 the galactic forces of the Milky Way. So this is an actual active picture that you can see in, in, in motion if you go to that website. And I'm just so sorry I couldn't I could not um, get it to uh, to capture it. This is what it looks like in a bigger uh, drawing. Okay. Now the interesting thing here is the consideration is the tail and the beginning of it because in some cases you have really low activity stars and they end up getting pulled, delayed back. High energy stars are affected differently by the gravitational fields. So as this thing travels around and gets destroyed by or separated out into streams, you begin to see, and you know the energy of the star, okay, then you can begin to see the gravitational effects of the overall Milky Way on these, on, 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 at given points during, during, it's, as it traverses around the, uh, the galaxy. What do you mean by high energy star? Mm -hmm. High energy stars like, would be stars that, that were bigger and, you know, I had large velocities and stuff. Right. Kinetic energy. I would guess so. Energy. They des they and describe it as high energy stars. And, yeah, I think they have combined that term into a whole series of things that are that have a whole lot of reactive. One half mb squared sounds official to me. Yeah, um, the models that fit well do they want to incorporate uh, uh, dark mass? Yeah, they do. What they want to do, though, is they want to fit these things Not because I mean, whether people want to do, do the models ask for them, so to speak, to fit one. Do they? Do the models ask for dark matter? I don't know. I don't know. I do know one thing, though. One of the results of in, when they finally do fit them will be they'll be able to see what are the forces and what the absence of forces were, which long, would be dark matter, right? Not or, far enough along to answer my question. Well, right. Well, the other thing is they, they can figure that out with the center of mass, <coughs> couldn't they? If, they? if the center of mass is not where it's supposed to be, and then that would demand the dark matter. Or if the orbits are perturbed. Yeah. That's probably the more likely if the orbs are perturbed. But again, well, they're in the process now of doing this. This is ongoing as we speak right now. What was your... Some very bright people have been working on these problems for decades. <clears throat> MIT people. Mm -hmm. uh, modeling gal galaxy collisions. And we see them all over the universe. I mean, right. We see galaxies colliding and it's quite obvious that that uh, it's been going on since the birth of the universe. Yeah. But this is a, an attempt to actually see the actual motion through which it happened. Yeah. And if you can see the actual motion of width through which it happened at any given point along that stream, you should be able to say, hey, I wonder why this occurred Find here. Detail, yeah. And why does this occur here? Why did it loop back and spiral? If you look at, I, 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 I wish I could have brought this in motion because if you saw it in motion, it's the weirdest thing in the world because it curls back on itself and, it, yeah. and it's really strange, sir. Yes, sir. When, when our own galaxy collides with the Andromeda galaxy, as predicted in about two billion years, mm. we don't wear an umbrella. Mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm just curious if they had They'll any pass right through each other. Super galaxy that, that you know. The, the models say that we are going to merge with Andromeda. Yeah. And I was wondering if there was a name for it, like Pangea was kind of like the <laughs> Well, maybe it's your name. Well, here's the, de here's the deal. You're, you're going to have two. Okay. Here, here's, here's the deal. We got a wishy washy black hole. 
right? Mm -hmm. We don't have a really neat black hole like the Andromeda system supposedly has, right? We may lose. Well, they have a double. I think they have a double. Got, and there's uh, evidence that they have a double. A double? From a merging, I, said, I didn't even know that. A merging of two galaxies. <laughs> well, doesn't the double come together? Anyway, I got to get going because oh, I already right. see yeah. they already read, tried to give me the hook over there. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take you back to the good old days. Most of you are going to be bored to death by this, but I, did, I do need to know that everybody knows what a pulsar is. Okay? Yep. I do need to know that. Yeah. Because yeah. from henceforth, we're going to talk about pulsars. And if there's anybody in the room that doesn't know what a pulsar is, it's. Does anybody here not know what a pulsar is? I mean, it's really cool if you don't, because that gives me an opportunity to go into a spiel and I can, you know, show that what little I do know about. Because remember, I started, I, this is the back door of astronomy, right? Okay, I'm going to presume that everybody kind of has a general idea of, of this and, and proceed forward. If you don't, then stop me somewhere along the way and we'll... May I ask a quick question? You certainly can. Um, uh, when you're computer is just sitting there enjoying life and doing these computations, do you also include the GPU for your computation? I absolutely do. Okay. As a matter of fact, my little computer's got a GPU. Okay. And it's and you've you've put that into the computation. Yeah, because because the, the, the system sends me information specifically for that GPU. Okay. Got it. Yeah because they know they're coming on and furthermore in the future they know that most people won't have these big clunkers on right. on their desk it'll all be on pads so they're getting ready to take advantage of that population too okay, okay even though it's slower computers right. in the near future that, that there's their massive numbers and we like massive yeah. numbers you can yeah. tell but anyway what is the gpu as opposed to a cpu a graphical processing unit versus a central processing unit. And the graphical processing units usually are faster than the CPUs. Mm -hmm. So they'll do, their floating point operations are super fast. And if you can send the, the computations to your GPU and let it, let it do the computations and pull it back out again, it's way faster than using your CPU, usually. And, and as a matter of fact, what happens is and we're building boxes now with nothing but these graphical processing units, mm -hmm. since they're incredibly much faster than a regular, the, the, the central processing unit you have in your regular computer, <coughs> you, the, the brains of the computer, and since these things are faster, they're actually building boxes now with just these in them, okay, for this purpose, so, so, because they're so much faster, and you can do so many more mathematic problems with it. Does that make sense? Where's the difference in the in the chips? Yeah, speed. Yeah, yeah. They're all oh, they're massive massive just parallel. Parallel. Yeah. Because they're they're they're, they're reduced instruction sets, what we used to call them in Motorola right. a long time ago. Right. They don't do a lot of other stuff. Oh. And they're, 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 they do what? They're really reduced instruction sets, and so consequently they don't have to be bothered by thinking about, you know, uh, well. The mouse. Yeah, <laughs> the mouse. yeah, 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 exactly. Right. Exactly. Or you can find the gamers. Huh? You can find the gamers. I know that. Yeah. This was, this was included to bring everybody back together because I knew this would be a wonderful outfit, so yeah. Isn't that beautiful? So anyway. <laughs> okay, we're going to change, we're going to change uh, uh, things now. While there's no doubt the two projects I've described so far, SETI, and Milky Way are scientifically significant. There are other projects using the Boink framework that are just as significant. And Einstein at Home is more complex and designed to measure gravity wave propagation, signals from several um, signals from s several sources like radio telescopes, gamma rays measured by the Fermi satellite and gravity wave um, um, uh, observatories. Okay, this is the 
this is simply the screensaver that Einstein at home is. This is what I at home see. And this is looking at the reverse of the constellations, in case you're wondering. The thing there, the, the, the crosshairs, as you can see, is, is where it's pointed toward it again in the moment. But what you don't see here is little L's that would represent the three big gravity wave observatories, which I'll get into in just a second. <clears throat> okay. Search for weak astro astrophysical signals from spinning neutron stars, pulsars. That's why I went through that thing about pulsars, because I want to be sure everybody was on the same page with me. And LEGO stands for uh, laser interferometer um, Gravitation. gravitational observatory. observatory. And it also uses uh, radio telescope information from Arecibo and parks and the Fermi Gamma Ray Satellite. Thanks everybody for that little support there. Einstein at home volunteers have discovered more than three dozen new neutron stars and our long-term goal is to be the first direct detection of gravity wave emissions from spinning neutron stars. Now, here's a very interesting problem. I have this pulsar. It's rotating, right? It, it started rotating the, the, the time it became a a, 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 a pulsar. What's that effect called? It became a neutron star. Yeah, it became a neutron star. Yeah, but it's, it's a neutron star. Uh, what is the... Magnetron? Magnetron? No, what is, what is the... Condensation? No, no, no. When it's... Uh, the, you know when... When it, get, when it contracts, it spins fast. Yeah, it spins faster. Well, what is that called? That's what the ballerina is. Yeah, so it's it's conservation of... Conservation of... There yeah, you go. Perfect. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so... But, but, but the problem is that these things slow down. Now, you don't get nothing for... Something for nothing in nature. You got to pay something. Now, it does re emit a lot of radiation, but it's got to radiate, it's got to be giving out more than just radiation in order to slow down. Okay? They're incredibly massive. So, they're one of the most, they're most massive things in, in the universe. No. So, neutron stars aren't okay, like magnetars are. More right, but they're they're one point three solar. Dense. Okay. Do you mean dense? One of the densest dense. things in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're it's incredibly the dense. Yeah. yeah. So densest thing is like, did I say what did I say? Massive. Massive. Oh, I'm so sorry. Densest. I meant densest. Yeah. Dense. I was thinking way. Anyway, thank you very much. Anyway, so the one of the densest thing. So what is it that they are giving up? And the the theory is that they're giving up gravity waves. And that theory is that those gravity waves can propagate across space and can be dete eventually detected here on Earth. Okay? So that's one of the objectives of Einstein at home. And they propagate at the speed of light, right? I don't know what... Nobody really knows. We don't know. We've yeah. never, we've never detected them. Lisa's got Gravity waves do, but not gravitons. We don't know the, the propagation velocity of gravitons. That's the problem. So what are the search problems that, the questions that would be answered by, the, um, by Einstein at home? What's the exact distance, spin frequency, and orbital parameters of a radio pulsar hit, possibly hidden in a data set? What ISM clouds dispersion of how, what do you do about the clouds of gas and dust dispersion that, that disperse radio waves? And in this particular case, they solve it by using 628 dispersion values, which they sample against it, and that's how they solve it. And they get a, a good approximation of, 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 of de dispersion. What about the unknown binary orbital parameters? Like, they do it by just brute trying thousands of, of, of possible orbital templates with the various Doppler spin-ups, spin-downs. Remember, we're talking about huge, big computers out there 
working throughout the world attacking this. So we don't have to be super elegant about this. Okay? We radio pulse our presence in the in the data using frequency analysis for your transform to recover recovering spin frequency without smearing. Now one of the problems with with previous methodologies of looking for for pulsars, particularly binary pulsars, is when they're really close together, the the acti the, the actions of them, the movement, causes a smearing of, of 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 the reception of the data, and so consequently you can't see the 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 the, 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 the the, the, you can't distinguish the pair, if there is a pair or, or three of them, whatever it is, whatever number it is. But what we do is we go down by summing the fundamental frequency components, the intrinsic spin thing, and the higher harmonics. So we look at the entire signal that's coming in, we parse out the various components of that really look at it at a very, very micro level, which is possible when you've got thousands of computers looking at it, and we go down in there and look at all the variations, and then we, try, we match up and see if variations end up being harmonics of that fundamental. And if they're harmonics of the fundamental, then we can match those together and say, oops, there's a signal there. And then that goes that that takes us right back to where the signal is, and now we can we've got ourselves a signal. And now we can start to to analyze that signal. So it's a much more sensitive methodology of looking for for pulsars in all the racket, and particularly when you've got binary pulsars or a pulsar and, and a white dwarf or a, or some other body and it's confusing because they're going so fast around each other this methodology can find those and has. Okay, finally the report it reports most of the significant candidates back from the host to the Einstein at home servers and analysis by the project scientists. Okay, before 2009 Einstein at home used the laser-based um, laser gravitational interferometers, okay? And those are located in Livingston, Louisiana, Hanford, Washington, and Hanover, Germany. I know there are others in the world. These are the ones we're using for Einstein at home, okay? We measure the gravitational wave induced motion between the separated free masses. Each has two storage arms, two to four kilometers. You start out with a laser beam, shoot it this way, you shoot it down, back, splits, goes back this way, goes down this way, goes back and <coughs> forth and back and forth until you have equivalent to a very, very, very long right angle signal, then you bring it back and compare it to the original signal. Okay, compensated obviously. And when you compare that, what you're looking for is a gravity wave would come through here, since these are two to four kilometers long, wouldn't it stretch that tunnel? And that's what you're looking for. You're looking for a change in dimension in one way or the other. Okay, and now because we've gotten to the point where we can see not only are we measuring this from the perspective of the 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 way the the, the, the feedback coming from this, but we measure various feedbacks and we can make it omnidirectional. So we'll know what direction this wave is coming from. So it's improved and it's gotten much more sensitive. The way they hang the mirrors, the way they hang the tunnels, the way they dampen out earth more noises has improved incredibly more uh, since they started this project. They still haven't detected a gravity wave, but they are very hopeful that they will. And they need an enormous amount of computing power to do this 
They probably couldn't afford it, but they have Einstein at home. And Einstein at home has enough people and computing power to support this. Okay. So I'm trying to, I know I'm probably running late now. So. Just as an aside, Hanover, Germany has two ends, not one. Okay. <laughs> We're PhD physicists. We don't have to know how to spell. <laughs> <laughs> but Wayne actually does. <laughs> Liberal art. Okay. All right. So Einstein at home, basically, the, the, the flow diagram is as, just as I described it. It measures uh, the RF signals. It goes to interstellar media. It comes back here. Goes and it goes through spectrometers. But it's broken up into, into different segments. Comes down, puts on disk. It goes to Cornell University. From Cornell University, it goes to the Einstein, Albert Einstein Institute in Germany, and then is sent out through through Boeing to the various um, users, the hosts rather. Comes back and then is is vetted. Can I ask another question? You sure can. Um, how are you keeping someone from cracking into your computer if you leave it on 24-7? Firewalls. Well, yeah, but, but they can be cracked. I always worry about that. And I have the regular, uh, you know... Um, have you ever had it broken into? No. How long is your, your pass code? I mean, is it like 12 units long or for your password? 128 Yeah. Uh, the only place, the only security that I have is I have the regular Norton. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. and if, it, if they want in that bad, the only thing I really worry about is not them destroying my computers. It's that they use my computers for the nefarious pass through to right. somebody okay. else. That's exactly. that's what would bother me. Yeah, if you're most. looking on twenty four seven, someone can. Yeah, I'll use it as a pass through to go through and and you know t talk about how they're <coughs> lost in Africa and they need money or something oh, yeah. like that. You know, so. Save the princess. Yes, <laughs> I got one of those. Too. I have two. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I've, I've pretty much but covered that. To. That's what the actual signal looks like right there. I'm not going to go through a lot of stuff, but it's, this is their first signal that they got. It's the famous PR, PSRJ 2007 plus 2722, and they talk about this like just pages and pages and pages of because they're so proud that they actually got it to work and they, they received that. But immediately after that, they started receiving other, they per started perceiving other pulsars. So, J. That's in the J, galactic plane. J, that huh? In, that is in the galactic plane. Yeah. So those coordinates. Yep. So this is not some synthesized signal to see what one would look like. No, this, this is the real thing. For real. Huh? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So this is the J, since J, there's a typo up there, it should be just J2007 20, plus 2722, and that's, uh, those are some of the parameters involved, and if you're really interested in that, I can, I can always get those to you. I'm, I'm really sort of running late now, I'm, I know. It's so Saturday night, we've got all night. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, there are, I know, I know somewhere in the crowd there's an x ray person, you know, there's always that x ray person. So I put up Chandra, I actually saw it too, okay? So I just want to. Uh, those I'm, are the ones who do it with high frequency. <laughs> <laughs> and then the visual crowd, there it is. <laughs> For the visual crowd, okay. But anyway, I just wanted, to, I'm trying to please everybody. The Australian Telescope National Facility Pulsar Catalog listed it and, and put down the parameters of it. So I thought that was pretty cool because. And then they found it again because now again a lot of these things have to be re-verified, okay? Because this is this is noisy stuff, okay? This is 
this is on tapes, okay? And a lot of times, and, and, and it's old data that they're going through again in some cases. They're re-examining. So it's always good to have somebody back go back out and look at these things and verify what you're seeing. So Parks did it, and they went out with that beautiful uh, telescope, and I just... I really put that in there because I love that the way that telescope looks. It's just it's so sexy. Now, if I understand you, that's a gravitational wave signal seen with what? Three that's no, 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 no. Remember what when we it? remember so when we went back there, and we said they are receiving RF signals and gravity waves. Yeah. They yeah. haven't gotten anything in the gravity wave detectors. Okay. That's what I thought. Yeah. If they found gravitational waves, we would have heard we about it. We would have heard about it. Yeah. <laughs> now, the interesting thing, though, is... Oops. You didn't like me. Sticky keys. Yeah. I can't see. I'm going the wrong way. That's the problem. Okay, this is what the... Uh, the uh, Einstein and Holm catalog. This is just a little tiny portion of what's been discovered so far using Einstein at home. So I'm just giving you to impress you with the number of stuff that's been discovered. A lot of this sucked out of tapes that were just, you know, that never had been discovered before. And it's pretty impressive. We we're also hooked up to the Fermi. Uh, The Fermi uh, gamma ray <laughs> satellite, and these are some of the things that Fermi has used a SETI, um, not SETI, but uh, uh, Einstein on at home to find. Now, if I was at home and I wanted to, now I could put, I could put SETI on my computer. And I could say, I got SETI on my computer. And I could get this neat screensaver. Right? And it, every time I turned on the computer, the screensaver would come up. And that's, I wouldn't have to do anything else. Ever. It would just come up, I'd see it, it would be great. But you can go into any one of these projects and get this kind of metadata, okay, which indicates in this particular slide all about my computer and this happens to be my bigger bigger computer which has got two processors six 6276 processors running on a server board nice. and it's well they're not very fast but anyway so and these are the projects and this is a starting up so I can see all the parameters. I can get this kind of information from Boink. And then I can look down here and actually see the projects as they're completed and being requested. And this is me talking, my computer, this same computer, talking back and forth to these various projects. Hey, you got anything for me? No, I don't have anything for you. No, you, you know. Oh, I'm reporting it. I'm reporting something completed. Okay, I'm not asking for more tasks. I got plenty. Okay, so there's this constant conversation with these millions of computers with Boink. Okay, so it's always talking back and forth. Although you can go offline and it'll see, keep on computing, but it it this is just a houseware, and I know this is boring to death. And then we have pretty pictures that, you know, you're supposed to wrap up every everything with. And this, of course, is the pretty picture that everybody loves. And, yeah, the horseshoe crab. And then we got some ionized gas. Remember I kept saying ISM? Well, this is what it looks like when it's getting ionized hydrogen of it's getting warmed up in the crab pulsar. And that's the end of my speech for the day. Do I have any questions? Can I have a light? Yes, sir. Uh, you talked about that uh, initially it was three computers had to 
agree, and that there were people who, whose mission was to try to crash the system, but they said, now you only have me two to agree. Mm -hmm. Why do they think they don't need to have, you know, how do they improve the security or, or, or stop the baddies from... <clears throat> Well, because because they split up who the the different computers that are handling the individual chunks of data. So now it could go to Germany, it could come to me, and between the two of us, and they geographically they found out the more that they spread out the data all over the place, it, it was impossible to spoof it. And, and then they do some checks, they do some little surreptitious checks they don't tell you about it afterward when it gets home. Yeah. Any other questions? Sir, I have a comment on the wimpy black hole. I read, I think it's in the most recent science, that uh, they've discovered a magnetar that they think is actually the cause of the weakness. It's, mm -hmm. it's keeping the material from flowing into the bottle. Very interesting. That's and of course, it was an art, most of it I didn't understand. I'm, a, I'm not an astrophysicist. I'm a celestial mechanician. So mm -hmm. I don't, I don't get that Why did they say it's wimpy? It's four million solar masses. Yeah, but in the grand scheme of black holes, you know, it's not a it's not a great black hole. Okay, and and, 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 and actually, it does have some peculiar characteristics it, it, about it that are not fine as to mass, but it's not active. It's fine. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not active. It's if not it were active. active, we would be in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. well, we'd be a Seifert galaxy. <laughs> Active galaxy. Okay, one more question in there. Yeah, I just want to make one thank you very much. One little point about it. you made an inference to the spare capacity that these computers have, and I just wanted to point out. I've personally noticed, and you will as well, that the modern processors, depending on which one you're using, there are different power management settings, but. You, you will use a lot of electricity on some of these projects, potentially. Yeah. Um, for example, when I'm running my GPU uh, dual uh, graphics, uh, I've had electric bills over $100 a month simply running GPU. Wow. <laughs> uh, but on, on the other program, hand, so, on the other hand, yeah. majority of the people that are using <coughs> it are just using it as a screensaver. Right. So it's not going to use any more electricity in that mode than any yeah. than it would if it was yeah. just Mickey Mouse screensaver or a tree or a bug or whatever people do, you know. So, uh, but I agree with in my particular case when I run it, I use a lot of electricity, and one of my big uh, philosophic problems because I get electricity for free because I'm in a condo oh. is, <laughs> is no no wait a second is how do I reduce the power used in my house so that I don't use more power than my neighbors do and so what I did is I have a very efficient ref I changed out refrigerators I went to all LED lights and I have a very efficient dishwasher and every other appliance in my home has uh, was bought specifically for the purpose of compensating for the 600 watts that I consume continuously. I'll tell the environmental arm to they can de cease and desist. <laughs> but I'm serious. It, it, it bothered me, and, and you got a very very good point because there was there's a big philosophic problem. Now, I've gone to the homeowners co community and I've said to them, I will pay you extra money for this electricity. And they told me, Sarah, look at that spotlight right there. Yeah. That's got that's consuming just as much power as you do. Yeah, so it shouldn't forget even be it. there. Right. Yeah. So We're polluting the sky a thousand watts. <laughs> okay, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.